Hey everybody, I uh, just want to welcome you to episode three of The Panographers. Uh, my name is Gavin Farrell. I'm your host, uh, beaming in via Google Plus Hangout from Portland, Oregon, United States of America. We've got a pretty amazing international episode today. Um, we've got uh, Sergei Semenov from um, Moscow, Russia, and uh, we've got Morton Bo from Perth, Western Australia. So uh, we are representing, <laughs> we are, oh, and uh, so we're going to get started here. And um, basically this episode is about um, aerial panoramic photography. And it's a pretty uh, amazing field um, within the panoramic photography community. Um, it's still very difficult to achieve high-quality aerial panoramas, ma mainly because, um, and we'll get into the details about this later, um, you know, when you've got a camera flying up in the air, um, mm. there's all sorts of wind conditions and vibration from the, the different device that you're using to actually, you know, bring it in the air. Um, that keeps it from, you know, keeping the shot steady. Now, it's, it's easy to get one shot, but when you shoot a panorama, you need multiple shots usually. So... We're going to talk about that today in this episode, and um, like our past episodes, uh, we're going to show you some some of the masters, some of the people that are doing, they're not only doing aerial panoramas, but they're doing it phenomenally well, and they've won, I think both of our guests today have, uh, I think they've won uh, Epson uh, panel awards, and um, also, uh, you know, I think it's appropriate that the last episode was oceans, it was underwater. So today's episode is actually air, so above the water and up in the air. So it's kind of like complimentary. Um, so we have a live Q&A panel open. We actually got it working this, this week. So please, as you're watching the show, if you've got a, 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 a pressing question that you're dying to ask one of our guests, um, please feel free to uh, type it in our Q&A window, and we'll do our best to answer it. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Sergey to start his presentation. Okay. Hello, everybody. So I'm, as you see, in my head because I'm from <laughs> Russia. But today, you know, it's very warm, unusually warm. It's November in Russia, but still uh, very, very warm. So I don't need it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I would like to present today the, the project what where I'm working in right now, it's an uh, air panel project. So this is a project uh, mainly dedicated to the shooting of um, aerial panoramas, 360-degree panoramas, and the most interesting places of the most interesting places of all around the world. Um, and we publish them on our website. Uh, if you know, it's uh, airpano.com. Oh, we do it absolutely for free. We are traveling around the world, shooting the panoramas, and publish them every week or every 10 days. Uh, the new place uh, with a virtual tour. Um, I just can switch on my screen share, and we'll show you briefly how the site has looked like and what we are present presenting there. So here we go. This is the website of Airpano project. So we have a lot of panoramas already shot and a lot, a lot of uh, places we visited. It is more than 200 places all over the world already shot by our team. And more than 1,500 panoramas presented on the website. They, almost all of them are aerial panoramas and they're presenting uh, many, many places. It's like the uh, 100 or 200, depending how many, uh, how count, of the best places around the world. The most beautiful, the most interesting. And so here you may see uh, the geography. This is the map. Uh, showing how many places we already visit, 
shared and showed in our website. The red one is already done, and uh, the gray one is going to be published soon. So, uh, as I told you, we did it. Uh, we're doing this uh, every week. So please uh, visit our website or subscribe, and you will get the news as soon as we uh, publish any new panoramas. So usually we do this in a format of virtual tour, um, like for example the Great Migration in Kenya. Uh, we put the article showing um, or just uh, telling uh, how we did uh, the panorama, some interesting information behind the scene, uh, maybe some opticals or uh, some interesting facts that we faced during the shooting, and uh, some general information about the place. So it's like, I don't know, the articles in the National Geographic or Animal Planet. Uh, Things. We also publish here the video, a real video or the regular one from Land if we did some, and you could leave the or the visitors could leave here the the comments as well. So <coughs> here is how we do our virtual tours, how we program them, and uh, how it looks like. They usually contains the music which we select for each virtual tour. Uh, separately, and we usually put the info signs for those uh, who could, just, who, who wants to learn or just interested in, uh, in some parts of the panorama. And here is the list of panoramas. Usually we do around 10, but it could be more. Mm, last week, we or two weeks ago, we published the grand, uh, the very big virtual tour over the Iceland. So it contains uh, 82 panoramas shot uh, during our three trips to, to Iceland and showing the many, many tourist places all over the island. And by the way, here is the, the first, our first panorama that we did over the animals and showing the animal life. <coughs> okay, two words. Uh, so here is uh, how it looks like, how we usually uh, do and how we usually present our material, the results of our shooting. And a couple of words uh, who we are and uh, who is doing this project. The Arpana is a non commercial project. We do not raise the, the profits. Uh, we just, the group of photographers, this is the, by the way, main. Uh, think why our panoramas look like uh, they look, because we come here from uh, from a landscape photography. We have eight uh, members in the project. Uh, here are they. You could read it on the, our website, as I'm showing you. Um, most of them are photographers, and we have one um, person, Stanislav, uh, he is the operator of uh, radio controlled helicopter. Here is the helicopter showed on the screen on the picture, but uh, now we usually use the hexacopter with uh, six rotors. And here is the Oleg Gopanyuk. He is the founder of the project. Is uh, I like our the father of Airpano and is <laughs> uh, a very good guy. Um, <coughs> Also, I would like to show you some uh, useful information that could be uh, found here is uh, frequently asked questions, how we do this, how to use the website, and even showing uh, some tips and tricks how we do the aerial panoramas. Here you may see the video from the YouTube, and you could also visit the YouTube channel of Airpano RU. It calls Airpano RU. And here you will see uh, the many, many videos that we publish. Sometimes it's showing just some video clips about our shootings, sometimes uh, showing the objects of shooting, and sometimes interesting uh, stories behind the scene. And at the end, at the bottom of the page, you will see some techniques, how we shave the, the, the lenses, for example, or um, what kind of an equipment we use. 
And how we do it here is, for example, even uh, the video from the helicopter, outside the helicopter even. So <clears throat> this is about who we are. Um, we do it uh, for absolutely for our own money. And as I told, we do not sell uh, uh, the content for, for living. We are not the commercially oriented. Uh, we usually shoot um, <coughs> the places for hey. ourselves as a photographers. Hey, as Sergey, the uh, yep. can, I, can I ask you a quick question here? Sure, go ahead. How do, you, how do you guys decide on your next location? I mean, because you guys have so many places around the world that you've already, you know, been to. Um, how do you guys make the next determination or the next decision on where to shoot? We have uh, our panel meeting. Uh, it um, happens uh, usually in Moscow when uh, it's uh, rare occasions because uh, not many times in Russia in the year, during the year, when the all eight members of Erpano are <laughs> in, in one place, in one city. So we're gathering and deciding um, the list for the list of places we want to use, uh, we want to visit next year, combine it, uh, because usually all people, all members has their own opinion, their own view of uh, what places are the more important and uh, more beautiful in some periods. Like, you know, we're shooting the Great Migration when it happens. And, for example, Peterhof uh, in St. Petersburg, it looks uh, more beautiful during the, the summer when the fountains are on. And the Iceland is very beautiful during the summer. So we're collecting all the information uh, because we travel a lot, we know uh, where in some places is better weather and sun and uh, other conditions. And uh, make the schedule for next year uh, what to shoot. Oh, here is how it comes. Usually we give the pro priority to the world famous places like uh, Great Wall or Great Pyramids or whatever. And then uh, we visit. And other places like, I don't know, some, some small cities, they're still very beautiful, but maybe not that famous and not that popular among the tourists. Awesome. And uh, some history maybe or some information that um, I want to share with you at how the, the project started. We started it, now I think I could even come back to, to the camera. I know. Will it show me now? No. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so we started the project in uh, 2008. Uh, Oleg Dupanyuk, as I, as I said, uh, it's a founder. Um, he, we met uh, each other, uh, the members of Erpano, before uh, the project started because we are all photographers and we used to travel around the world in the groups. Like we call it photo safari, when uh, one of uh, interesting or the, the famous photographer uh, in Russia or abroad organizes the, the tour for 10 or 5 to 15 people to some interesting places like Rio de Janeiro or Iguazu Falls. And in these trips, we get acquainted with each other. And uh, one day in 2008, uh, Oleg uh, just told us, OK, guys, and let's try doing these things uh, to shoot something from air. We travel around the world a lot. And why not to rent a helicopter and to make some, some panoramas uh, from, from the air? And that was our main problem. We, <laughs> as you know, to make the good panorama, spherical panorama, you need to keep nodal point. And how to do this in, in the air? That was the first technical problem that we faced. <laughs> we we yeah. tried to, took the, to take the, um, the tripod inside the heli and say, OK, no, <clears throat> this is not a good idea. And uh, then we decided how is better to try to understand how is better to shoot the 
the panorama maybe to make some crosses uh, with a helicopter and shooting uh, in the middle, just make the, the circles. Of just It was really hard task in 2008 for us. <laughs> we didn't know anything about, uh, about the shooting panorama in the air. And then we decided uh, to hover the helicopter, to ask the pilot hover the helicopter, and to spin around itself or make a small circles. The first pilot we, we asked this, it was a, a lady, uh, Maria, and uh, she, she, she told us uh, it is almost impossible, it's very hard to do. <coughs> because the helicopter is full, it's too heavy, and you know, guys, <coughs> we'll try, but I cannot promise you anything. So this is, it was the first hour attempt to shoot the panorama, and now I will, yeah, come back to, to the screen, and we'll show you the result. It was the San Juan River. Here is our first aerial panorama. It was a hard task for the pilot, and after this flight, she told me, OK, even in my uh, exams uh, for getting the, the flying license for a pilot, it wasn't so difficult like with you guys. Um, to be honest, it wasn't really difficult. It, after, <laughs> after so many years passed, I could say it wasn't very difficult for the pilot, because we then fly even uh, more difficult conditions. But the first time is always really hard. So uh, we started with uh, this panorama and published everything uh, on our website just at the places where we were, at the places where we visited. They were interesting, and we fly at any place uh, where the helicopter was available. But uh, then we realized that Maybe it is not that it interesting for the people to look the places uh, like this with the very high altitudes and look sometimes like a Google Maps. And we tried to develop our technique and uh, have the pilot go lower in some places and shoot them uh, with the lower altitudes uh, to show to the people uh, the main objects to be look uh, more interesting closer to the, to, the, to the people, because if you shoot the fisheye lens, you're always uh, feeling that it is not too close, not that close enough. And, and then we face another problem that in many, many places uh, it is not uh, possible to fly uh, the helicopter uh, because, of the, because it could be expensive or it's forbidden to fly or uh, even just no helicopters uh, around 1,000 uh, kilometers around the, the place. So no chance to shoot. And then uh, step by step, we come to the, to the idea that we need to make the, the helicopter or to rent a helicopter radio control, the small one, which could be a more useful tool for shooting panoramas. And at that time, we met the Stanislav, uh, who was flying with the uh, gasoline uh, helicopter. Oh, yeah, here is some slideshow of how we're doing with the big helicopters. And then I will show you how we do it. Ah, no, I have, yeah, I have it. So it was the, the helicopter that we used first time. Uh, it was, <laughs> I'll give it, it's okay. Awesome. okay. Uh, in your screens, not too small. No, it looks good. Uh, it looks, actually, your images are coming in nicely. And uh, the first time we met the stars, and that was the first time when we see how it uh, looks like and flies, he took the altitude of 300 meters, and at the highest altitude, the helicopter uh, turned vice versa and started falling down uh, the rotor down <laughs> with the unbelievable speed. 
<laughs> oh no! I realized that oh, it's it just oh, it, it's impossible. How to do this? And the pilot was uh, <laughs> so frustrated and so uh, stressed. But at the end, uh, Stanislav he turned the helicopter back, and uh, I don't know, 50 meters uh, above the the ground, uh, he stabilized the helicopter, landed it, and with a very shaking hands, legs. And everything. <laughs> okay, no more. <laughs> that was again the second no more that we heard in our <laughs> practice of shooting panoramas. Next day, he took the the helicopter to the shooting the the port, river port uh, in Moscow, and uh, it fell down in the water. Oh no! So yeah, it was uh, underwater photography. <laughs> And, and we, when we got out with oh. the use of divers, uh, our equipment, after two days, it looked like this. Oh, no. Nice. And then we said, OK, let's refuse from the gasoline helicopters. <laughs> Try the, the, the another type of equipment. And yeah, it, uh, I don't have the, the, the picture. And this hexacopter is and they collect it uh, in the normal way, but <laughs> it is uh, also some photos from from our test flights. So you can see the Canon 5D Mark II and the Sigma 15 millimeter lens lying down here. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's our lessons that the, we step. And we learned a lot of uh, useful information how to shoot and how to upgrade the, the the helicopters. I can say that this helicopter was made in 2009, I think. 2009. Uh, it uses the the German brains. Um, um, just forgot the the name of the company. Doesn't matter. So, but we understand the very important thing is that security is very, very important. <laughs> and now we have a strict <laughs> do not fly over the people. Never. Never around, uh, above the heads of the people. We do it uh, above the water, but not very often. We do it above the grass, uh, any other buildings, but not the people. And all the time we double our equipment. In case we travel around the world, we take two helicopters with us. Uh, I mean, the hexacopter, the small one. We put them in, uh, in the suitcases. We have at least two or three cameras, and uh, everything doubled. Uh, so this is uh, how it uh, went on uh, from the technical side. From a technical point of view, but from the artistic and the, um, the interesting thing uh, for us, like uh, photographers, uh, we started to measure our quality of our panoramas, but we has had no idea how to to understand. Do we are we doing this uh, good enough, or we should go better and doing doing this of more quality, or I don't know, more artistic, or whatever. So we showed our panoramas to to other people, but uh, I don't know if you show the people uh, the, phot the photography that you're doing to your mom or to your family all the time. They're saying, "Oh yeah, that's perfect. That's good. That's uh, the greatest one." If you show <laughs> the panorama to some competitors or to other photographers, sometimes they even do not understand how they shoot, and they say, "Okay, yeah, it looks good. Looks uh, unusual, but..." Nothing, and then we discovered that there is an Epson um, Pano Awards, and we started to uh, send our photography, our panoramas to to the um, competitions, to the photo contest, and uh, Epson Pano Awards, we joined in 2011, uh, and it was the regular aerial panorama that Oleg uh, Gopanyuk did, and we won. It was the, the really we couldn't expect this. And it was for us like uh, say okay, so now we are 
we understand that we are on the right way and doing the good. And at that year, in 2011, at the same time, we understood that in aerial panoramas and in 360 panoramas, we are not the first. <laughs> we took only third place, and we saw Martin's uh, panorama and the Ignacio uh, panorama. These are the, the great panoramas, and then we decided, OK, next year we'll try to, to reach the top. And <laughs> next year we took the second, third, fourth, and fifth places. Oh, sorry, fourth, and then some other places uh, from the ten, uh, top 10 and top 50, but again not the first. And uh, this year it was a very happy year, lucky year for us. And we took uh, our photographers, Dmitry and uh, Ivan. Uh, they took first five first places uh, from the uh, from the top 50 <laughs> panoramas and uh, overall uh, 25 panoramas from 50. And now we <laughs> just <laughs> understand that we are developing in the right way, in the artistic uh, sense and the technical sense. Uh, like this. So, and uh, from my side, I could recommend uh, to all photographers um, participate in the, in the competitions because then you'll understand your real level. Not from the family, not from the friends, not from maybe your uh, close uh, people to you who couldn't be uh, the realistic, let's say, measuring <laughs> the quality. Uh, <coughs> Um, then uh, we also, I could say that we paid a lot of attention not only for technical side but on the artistic um, side uh, of our panoramas. Here you may see the spherical panorama that we took in uh, 2008 uh, or 2009 over Amsterdam. This is how it looks like. Um, so I would say it's not that beautiful that this one. Uh, so we pay a lot of attention to the Photoshop work and retouch work of the panoramas to make them look uh, more beautiful for 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 visitors. <laughs> Sometimes uh, it, they could be realistic with the uh, absolutely black shadows because uh, yeah the camera showed like this, but we 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 think that it should be it should look uh, like the human eye used to this, with the normal shadows, with normal lights, and we spend quite a lot of time of, uh, for keeping the quality on the same level. <coughs> and this is also critically important for us. Hey, Sergey. Yep. You know, one thing I've noticed, a lot of people that have seen your work, they always comment on how well you guys do the sun and when you're shooting directly in the sun. Do you have any? Um, do you guys sh uh, shoot a different exposure for the sun and then Photoshop that in, or? Uh, yeah, it's a kind of. Uh, it's not even a, a top secret. Mm, nowadays, the quality of the 5D Mark II Canon and the Nikon D800 uh, is enough and sufficient to get the sun uh, revealed from with where. It looks very good, like like here, for example, or like uh, on the panoramas with the sky with the with the clouds on it. So no, some magic or no, a special technique for this. It is uh, just the uh, the quality of of uh, of the of the camera. But at the same time, I could say that we tried a lot of lenses, uh, like produced by Nikon, Zeiss. Uh, and Canon and other producers, and we stopped on the Sigma because of the sun, uh, because it keeps uh, or it holds the direct sun and shows it very beautiful without uh, sunlights like like Nikon lenses. Uh, they do not like uh, the bright sun, the direct bright sun. Um, so, 
answering your question, Gavin, uh, we use uh, just the, the, the photo cameras uh, with the normal exposure and uh, the Sigma lenses. Thanks, Sergey. And the other question I had was, how do you guys determine what the maximum resolution is? It's just based on your equipment. The I mean, you guys, obviously, like, a big challenge is for a lot of aerial photographers is uh, shooting an aerial gigapixel image. So <laughs> uh, I haven't seen a lot of those done well. So, um, but I guess you guys just, your resolution of your panorama probably is already determined by the Sigma lens and the overlapping frames, right? Yeah, uh, we are usually oriented on the on the on the panoramas that we show on our website, which could be allowed uh, um, available for for many people, um, because <clears throat> you know we travel a lot and each place we visit we we try to to check the internet speed uh, for those people located in this place uh, how they could see our panoramas on our website. And uh, usually the speed quality is so awful in in most of the places. Even now, even this year, uh, in Maldives, for example, in the islands, the in the hotels, uh, the speed of internet is uh, very low. And that is why we do not publish the gigapixel mm -hmm. panoramas, even the tiled one. Uh, we publish the low resolution and high resolution. Here you may choose. The users could choose. And the high resolution we give uh, around 12 or 11,000 pixels uh, like rectangular projection, but originally it is uh, 14 or 20,000 um, pixels by 10,000 or 7,000. So we uh, just hey uh, uh, Sergey, we've got a we've got a live user question here. Um, Tong Gorohung, I can't pronounce his last name. He says, "Are you shooting bracketing?" Uh, sometimes, but um, again, no. We everything that you see on our website, it is uh, one shot, made with one shot, and the quality of uh, matrix and post production uh, allows us to get everything from shadows and from lights. Uh, but if we shoot the night panoramas from land uh, or from not moving objects, uh, we usually do the bracketing. Great, great. Um, yeah, it, it makes sense because a lot of your panoramas, they like you said, they look like they're they have very natural light. They don't look like um, they don't look unnatural like some HDR panoramas do. So. Yeah. Oops. So, um, <clears throat> ah, and also I just uh, wanted to mention that we work uh, with the um, magazines and uh, National Geographic, uh, Geo, uh, Daily Mail, The View magazine, the European magazines, and the uh, American one. They contacted us, and uh, you could see some of our panoramas on the um, iOS applications uh, of these magazines uh, almost it, each week. So we work with them very closely because just they're interested in the material and the panoramas that we have. And just we work with them as well. And <coughs> uh, speaking about the development of our technique, of our equipment, uh, I couldn't. Uh, avoid uh, the information that we were shooting the video, 360 video right now. Almost in all places that we visited, we tried to do this, either with uh, the big helicopter or with the small one with radio control. But at the same time, the speed of connection is not uh, enough to show the, the high resolution video. It's only uh, very low bitrate and very uh, low sizes. So as you may see, I'm showing this on the screen. Uh, uh, for uh, for this reason, we split even uh, more with a low resolution recommended and high resolution. But at the same time, I would say that even with this, uh, still it's very difficult, hard uh, for the users to watch the video. 
we already shot uh, around 15 places uh, with the 360 video technology, but published only two. Next week is going to be the Himalayas video, but still that's maybe not that beautiful like uh, static panoramas because it's a bit tricky and hard to, to shoot and to post uh, post processes. Okay, uh, I would say that more or less the introduction to the Airpano project is uh, over and uh, I'm ready for the questions uh, about the technique or any other side of Airpano. I don't know if somebody got has or just pass the the word to Martin. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I was wondering if you could show um, the awards, that maybe the video of your award ceremony. I thought that would be people might find that interesting. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> if you're will, if you're willing to show it, um, we've got um, lots. Of, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we've got lots of. Um, of people watching the program live. Does anyone watching the show live have any questions um, for Sergey regarding um, sort of their basic uh, introduction and um, the equipment they use? I guess the question I would have, Sergey, is um, do you guys ever use any kites or, uh, or hot air balloons? Uh, we use the hot air balloons in, in some places in Myanmar and in some European places, and even the uh, Zeppelin or the, the moving uh, balloon with the uh, rotor in St. Petersburg, but it's so, um, let's say, depend, uh, depends on the, on the weather and the wind conditions that this tool and this instrument or the way to shoot the aerial panoramas is, is not convenient for us. Gotcha, gotcha. And you cannot go closer to some places or uh, choose the direction. You just fly with the wind, and that's it. So we did some just for fun to show to the people how it looks like. Uh, uh, you could just check it the, the website, and you will see it somewhere in Asia. Uh, we'll show you if I find it right now. I'm sorry, not, not that it is easy to find. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, a bit difficult. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to use this one as the search field. Okay, just yeah, we did it, but um, the, uh, because of um, our travels, uh, we travel a lot. Uh, it is not um, that uh, convenient for us to travel with the air balloon in the suitcases. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Uh, oh so, yeah, we decided to use the smaller one, uh, the hexacopters <clears throat> that we uh, disassembled and put in one uh, suitcase, and then like this. I've got your video queued up here. Um... Let me see if I can play. Can you guys see that at all? I don't seem to be able to share. Let's see. Not at the moment, no. Let's see. Push the talk. Oops. Um, Gavin, and do you see now the, the video, or still it's the website? Uh, I see your website still. Okay, so yeah, but I put the on the group chat uh, the link. Oh yeah, yeah, I've got that. I just I'm trying to figure out how to broadcast that live. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, I can see that there. Oh, I don't know. Will it work? Uh, yeah, give, hit play. Uh, yeah, there's no audio though. Let me um. 
Let me see if I can do it here. Yeah, but I could uh, uh, say some uh, words behind uh, how how it works. Um, yeah. How, how it was, because um, the year ago, I think, yeah, in December 2012, um, one of our friends asked us, uh, why don't we apply for the grant of Russian government, uh, governmental uh, society called uh, Russian Geographical Society. So, and we have no idea what is this and uh, how to apply for the <laughs> for the grant and at that moment it was a bit surprise for us but we entered their website we contacted them and uh, filled in the uh, some requirement that we are just shooting uh, all around the world and not shooting in, in in Russia because we are short in the budgets and could we do this uh, in in just uh, with the help of uh, Russian government uh, of this society. And for our surprise, they answered <laughs> us and invited to, for, let's say, um, for scientists, uh, for the group of scientists uh, to present our project, to tell what we are going to do, what we are going to shoot. And uh, we uh, explained, and they agreed, they accepted, uh, and... Uh, uh, presented us with a with a grant, and asked to to come to the headquarter of this um, society uh, to to get this grant from the from the president of the society and the president of uh, of uh, of the foundation of this. I didn't believe that it could be like like this, and I asked, okay, let 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 us uh, send the courier for this. Uh, that our guy will come to your to the cabinet and <laughs> take the grant, <laughs> and they say, okay, well, you know, it's gonna be the president of the society. I say, mm, yeah, okay, but the president of the society is the minister minister of defense, and the the financial part is headed by the president Putin, and they say, yes. It is. I say, but <clears throat> how do you believe? Uh, you, you want to tell me that the Putin itself will present me uh, the the grant? And they say, yes, yes. <laughs> you was chosen by by the society that you are quite interesting in high technology project, and uh, you know we believe that it is uh, quite good for this. And then when I come to the show to to the to the ceremony. And they tell me, okay, here is the president invited and the, the minister of defense, and you know the rules. Uh, there is a strict uh, timing for this, and you have only 30 seconds to stand up from your chair, come to the president, shake the hand, take the, uh, the paper, uh, the grant, uh, and come back to your seat. <laughs> and at the moment when I come to the, to the Putin, to Vladimir Vladimirovich, and he say, okay, I know you guys, you're, you're doing interesting stuff, just tell something about it. Take the microphone from this girl and tell us. Uh, it was a surprise for me because I was not ready. I, I couldn't expect that they will ask about the project and about the, the stuff and I know that, uh, that I have only 30 seconds and I was really nervous. <laughs> and here you may see when the, the girl is coming that okay, he should stop. Uh, talking and uh, we have a timesheet and the Putin said, okay, no, 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 let's let let him talk. Uh, just show me continue and go ahead. And at this moment, I asked him to uh, to make the panoramas over the Kremlin because you know over the Moscow, over the whole city, it is forbidden to fly with any flying objects. It's helicopters, the uh, hot air balloons, anything. It's completely closed uh, sky. And the, the Kremlin is the heart of the Russia of, of Moscow and it is the most secured place I would say <laughs> because it's the residence of the president of Russia. But I think that now or never, okay, and ask him <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, could I could I ask you just to, to give us the permission uh, <laughs> to fly over the, the Kremlin? And he said, oh, "Okay, you know this is not my responsibility. Talk to the Minister of Defense." <laughs> and he was sitting just uh, to the left of him, 
And after everything uh, finished, I come to the Minister of Defense asking him, could I do this or not? Here is the moment when he is showing on the Minister of Defense saying, <laughs> okay, ask him. <laughs> is, that the, is that the guy at the table right there? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, can you, so you, so you were, and so because of that, you were able to shoot the Kremlin, right? Yes, and uh, that is uh, was the the lucky time for us, and they really allowed us to to shoot the Kremlin. And here you may see the the view that nobody before us, and I would say maybe in the, in the close future, nobody after us could do. Because you see, we were flying, I don't know, right, five meters uh, near the, the star on one of the towers. Oh, it, it's fantastic. It's phenomenal. And, and for us, it was dream come true because of the <laughs> complicity to get the official permission. It's funny that, you know, you guys travel all over the world to shoot these amazing aerial panoramas, and yet some a place that's so close to home was forbidden. And, yes. You know, and now you you were able to capture that. I mean, that must have been a wonderful feeling. And also, they, I mean, the images themselves came out so well. They're so phenomenal. I love this one. of I love that one. I've seen that one before where you're looking straight down. Yeah. And it, I, it's really like a view that I don't think anyone's ever seen before. Yeah, nobody. Nobody. I was flying here over the over the Red Square during the uh, parade, uh, military parade, uh, celebrating the second uh, the, the second World War ending. Uh, so, but it was closed, but not over its place. And yeah, it, that is impossible to shoot the panoramas uh, on this two hundred fifty kilometers. So, <laughs> without covering. It's rather difficult. But yeah, and the same story was uh, with was with the Taj Mahal, the most secured place in India, and nobody before us was flying uh, over this place. Only Jan Artus Bertrand, uh, he was flying near this place, shooting the aerial photography, but not the 360 panoramas, and we were asking the, a lot of people uh, here in embassy of India in Russia to get us, uh, to allow us to, to shoot this place. And after four months of uh, sending emails and uh, coming to their office and explaining what we want to do, they get us the permission and our team went to India. They went to the, the Taj Mahal bring the, all the documents, the papers that uh, showing that it is allowed to fly, and the director of the museum told, okay, uh, you know, guys, I'm sitting here in this chair for a lot of years, and nobody before you, and uh, asking uh, or were allowed it to, to shoot from the air and fly here from the territory of, uh, of Taj Mahal. So I could allow you to take the tripod on the territory. Nothing more until I'm sitting here in this chair. And <clears throat> you know, I see the papers, but maybe it's a fake, or the person who signed this uh, didn't know what to do. <laughs> and this moment, uh, we understood that it was almost we we failed in this shooting, and we started to call back to Moscow to embassy of uh, India. And next day, we were allowed it. Uh, the <laughs> the, first, the director of the museum didn't uh, went to us, but the security guy just tell, okay, you are allowed it, and you could fly here in the, in Taj Mahal. Can and you uh, <laughs> can you show us uh, those images on your website? Yeah, I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, here are they. Sergey, how many uh, how many days do you allow for a shoot? Do you guys get there a week ahead of time and then <clears throat> wait for an open window in the weather? 
Yeah, usually we do like this. We plan um, a couple of three days uh, for for one place for shooting, and we hope that the weather is going to be good in the in the days. And we just decide the right time for the shooting. It's usually sunset or sunrise, uh, more rarely in the midday because the light is not very good for photography. It's not so soft and not so uh, so brilliant like uh, during this uh, uh, good times for shooting. And <coughs> rent the big helicopter or take our small helicopter, hexacopter, and shoot the panorama set exactly at this time. And you guys also shot the Great Pyramids as well, right? That was that must have been uh, difficult to get permission to. And also the Eiffel Tower. Those are also those are two places that are tricky to get permission to shoot at. Yeah, but with the pyramids, we didn't get the permission uh, before we come to the place. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah, we were caught by police and by military guys. Uh, we were dropped in in our uh, car accompanied by the police and the military uh, mm, people, brought to the office of the Pyramid uh, Museum and told that, OK, guys, you have a really big troubles. And they were a revolution at that time in, in the Cairo. And they were so, um, um, how to say, stressed or, <laughs> yeah, re really stressed by all these uh, things happening in Cairo. Uh, and they say, okay, guys, uh, you are doing a very illegal things in, in using your drone uh, somewhere near the touristic places, and it's a very secured places, and etc., etc., etc. But as soon as we showed them the pictures, uh, because we did the first flight there, uh, the test flight. And explaining then that we do not fly over the people, we the, our equipment uh, with a weight of six kilograms or around eight kilograms with the cameras cannot damage the pyramids, like let's say the, the <laughs> so it's impossible. And show the the images, and they say, okay, mm -hmm. we see you have a very beautiful images. For that kind of a professional images, you have to get the professional permission. And it is very expensive. And as soon as they speak about the the price, then it's the first step to have ne to start negotiation and bargaining about the price because the Arabic countries uh, the price is never fixed. <coughs> so we started with two thousand uh, dollars for permission, and then end around eight hundred uh, <laughs> rate. <laughs> And we paid them um, to the museum. We got the, the receipt and everything. And next day, even uh, two security guys, they accompanied us. Uh, they helped. Um, they kept uh, the tourists and uh, some noisy local people out of us and allowing us to shoot everywhere in the, in the, in the territory of pyramids. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, do you guys have a team specifically that does the research uh, needed to get you know permission and grants and who to contact in these foreign countries to? I mean, imagine it must be a little bit difficult to find the exact office um, of each location that you know and all the the various paperwork that's involved. I mean, that must be a full time job into itself. Uh, actually, no. Mm, we are, as I told, non non commercial project, and we do it for our own own money. And so, if uh, but we are quite uh, experienced travelers, and uh, <coughs> more or less we know uh, now, uh, looking back to our experience, uh, where to apply for the for getting permissions, and before going somewhere to some places, we usually investigate. Uh, how easy it is accessible, uh, accessible the place, and could we fly there? Is it allowed it or not? But the last year, for example, in France, they took a new kind of legislation uh, regulating the air traffic, and it is very strict, and it is very difficult to get the permission for 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 flights. So you have to have a 
flying operator license and the certificate for the equipment and even pass a kind of an exam that you could um, operate the, the hexacopters or the octocopters <coughs> you have, etc., etc., etc. And then they set the time where you could fly, the place where you could fly. Uh, it's rather difficult now. But before this, they have no such uh, an occasions, and so not not not, a, not that many people try to fly with the with the radio controlled places. But uh, lucky we are that we already shot the <laughs> the Paris and uh, some other places in France. Can you um, would you be willing to show the high altitude uh, balloon uh, image that your your team shot? Oh yeah, once uh, one of our friends uh, told that, okay, guys, you shot so many places and uh, you took so many altitudes, but you haven't shot from from the space. <laughs> and yeah, we then we realized uh, really we have so we have not uh, done the this uh, photo shooting yet. And we found the the, the guy in Russia who had the. Um, <laughs> All the permissions from the military guys uh, for uh, sending the uh, how we call it uh, meteorological um, balloon to the high level. Um, I will switch off the music to the high level of uh, the stratosphere. <laughs> yeah. So we put the, a lot of cameras uh, on the rig and send the send it on, into space. But <laughs> after it landed back, uh, we yeah. How did you how did you find that like where it landed? Did you have GPS device on it or something? Yeah, we had a GPS device and we had the two cell phones. That could ring and could show the the place where it is landed, but they were they all were not working, and we lost one <laughs> setup of the equipment and the balloon. And so the second, uh, yeah, the second attempt was uh, was then <laughs> successful. So uh, yeah. As don't you told, have uh, don't you have some footage of where it landed? It was like there was like the 360 video footage also where. I know at that moment we didn't do the 360 video, just only photography. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Ignacio and um, Jürgen, with the help of Jürgen's rig, uh, they did the video. So they, here you may see how the, the balloon blowed up. And since that point, uh, the balloon starts falling down, and this is the, the highest altitude we took, around 37 or 35 kilometers above the sea level. Did you guys have it on an intervalometer or something where it was taking pictures every few minutes? Yes, yes. So we picked some most interesting. Here is the sunrise. We come to the, the place um, where we <coughs> were collecting all the stuff, <coughs> filling uh, the, the balloon uh, at 11 in the night. And then we did some preparation at 4 a.m. Uh, we launched uh, the balloon. And it started uh, going up. And it did it for during two hours. And after two hours, it blew. And then goes falling down, you know, maybe 10 minutes or just a bit less, falling down somewhere in the Moscow region forests. And uh, we did the full video and we did the article uh, explaining how we did this. Uh, it shows how to, to put the, so everything from behind the scene. From the technical side and the artistic side, you could watch this video. If there are now um, YouTube uh, <coughs> channel or here in the, in the in the video explaining what the problems we face, the temperatures, um, everything like this. 
So here we are tracking the the altitudes and everything. So suffice to say, the the panorama that has the most views is not what you would expect, correct? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, another story, Gavin, you're right. Uh, all the time we um, control our uh, the, uh, the quantity of visitors we have, the activity of visitors uh, on our website to make the interface of our website more convenient for, for the people, uh, for the visitors, and showing some most interesting places on the top places. And we control uh, how many visitors we have each day, um, weekly basis, and monthly basis. Um, so, and just after several years, uh, we launched the project. Uh, we started to calculate uh, what is the most popular panorama on our website. And it was a surprise for us that it wasn't um, really an aerial one, but semi aerial shot from the from uh, window of Manhattan and it was panorama that I did just for fun and <laughs> not for serious and published uh, just to have some laughs uh, I think we lost your screen there Sergey oh there it is I see it now I saw, oh, I saw it for a second there um, sorry now. <clears throat> Do you see it now? Uh, yes. So it was a panorama that I shot from the window of Manhattan, uh, New York M Millennium Plaza Hotel. It was the <laughs> When the when you can open the window in the hotels, mm, as far as I know, these days they have a renovation of the whole building, and I think they will fix this mistake. <laughs> Hope they they didn't see my panorama. <laughs> I did That's a couple great. of panoramas, one for fun and one, uh, let's say. Oh, you went from from beer to champagne or or white wine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, kind of a romantic one that took the third place uh, 2011 Epson Pan Awards in a spherical uh, as a spherical panorama. So all these panoramas I did uh, during the one night. It was the second night after my birthday, and in the morning I have to go to the airport, getting back to Moscow. And it was not very easy. Here you may see, as I told an article, how I how we did it. We showed the equipment that were used. It was RRS uh, rails and uh, the tripods and everything. And here you may see how to how to do this and learn how was Nadir done and everything. So I put the marks on the on the window and move the, the tripod to all the all the ticks and drifts and everything you, you you may read from from the article so all the time we try to to share with our visitors and the photographers and panographers uh, how to shoot some uh, interesting panoramas and uh, to be honest, the second place uh, on our ratings uh, and the most visited panoramas on our website is uh, Great uh, Pyramids and Giza, Egyptian pyramids. And yeah, third, you, can you show? Can you show those real quick? Yeah. And the third place it is um, uh, Taj Mahal.
all the programming we're doing on Kerpano, so this is not a secret, but uh, for those who are just starting starting the panography, uh, yeah, that may be useful. And at the moment we're doing ourselves, we do not use uh, any other software like uh, Colors, Pano Tour, or uh, Pano to VR, or Easy Pano, because we just made our own templates and we pretty happy with them, and we develop develop them from time to time just to follow the the needs and uh, the requirements of the of our visitors and some new technical things. So, oh, yeah, yeah, we have some. Yeah, I think I think um, uh, I think there's definitely people that are curious about your the way you guys do your interactive tours. Um, you guys said so. You don't use. You said you don't use KR Pano, and you guys kind of build your own. No, no, we, we use Carpano. We use Carpano, but uh, we build our interface ourselves. So we just program how, the way how it looks like uh, with gotcha. ourselves. We have a user question um, from Jan Lipka. He's asking if there was any uh, dust issues when you were shooting in Egypt in, in the pyramid shoot. Uh, actually, not because we keep all our equipment in the, in the, in the car, and we just take them out only in case uh, in, just before the shootings. So and we um, we start uh, we fly uh, from from the hand. You may see this uh, here on the video. I prepared it to show how it looks like. <coughs> so we use uh, it starts it launches from from the uh, pilot we call it pilot operator hands. So we do not put it on the on the land, and uh, that is why we just avoid the dust on the on the lens and on other equipment, on the part of the parts of the equipment. But it was a real problem. Uh, sorry, it doesn't have the new. We had a real problem in in Kenya, shooting the um, Great Migration. Um, <clears throat> with the dust. And that is why I took uh, all the time take with me the the plastic bags, like for a garbage, and they put we put all the equipment in them and take them out only before the, the before the shootings. So it also ha helps because in Egypt it wasn't so the dust and the sand uh, was quite uh, big and really wasn't that problem as uh, in, in in Kenya because the, the dust was very 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 small one and it covered all the equipment and the and the, and the backpacks uh, completely and uh, very fast so the the back, um, plastic bags usually helps Sergey I've got a question for you do you guys have uh, on your list of future places to shoot do you guys have Burning Man on there? Haha. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, but it's gonna be not uh, that quick. So it should be in August next year or uh, earlier, because we missed this uh, this year, and for next year we just plan. But I'm not sure that uh, whether we will go there. Yeah, I know. I know. Dust is a huge issue there. Uh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never visited, but uh, Dmitry and uh, some uh, other members of Erpano, they already been there and shooting there. But the regular photography, not the aerial one. So I think they pretty know a lot of this. The conditions there. Wondering, uh, does do any of the users that are watching this live broadcast? Does anybody else have any further questions for Sergey, while we still have him online on uh, here live? Uh, 
Um, not questions, but I, I have a question how to return back my video of my camera. <laughs> <laughs> you should be able to just turn off the um, screen share. It should toggle you back. Um, your camera, maybe your camera um, settings maybe have gotten changed? Uh, no. Well, we can pass the... We can pass the show over to uh, to Morton now, and and to, and then you know that give you a chance to get your camera back, Sergey. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that was. I mean, anyone that's a professional panoramic photographer um, is probably well aware of Air Pano. Um, they really set the the standard. They set the bar for high level, high quality panoramas. Um, not even aerial. I mean, they actually do. Even though they're called air pano, um, they actually do have other panos. They've got some underwater uh, sea caves, uh, ice caves that they've done, and um, you know, basically all the work that they they put out is top level um, and top notch quality stuff. Um, so, and I know they've been a source of inspiration for a lot of other people. Um, and I hope you I hope you enjoy what Sergey's been showing us. Um, and they're easy to get in touch with. Their website is loaded with information, as you've probably already seen. Um, and uh, you know, if you have any questions, you can always uh, email them directly. Um, we've got one user question from Jorgen uh, for uh, Sergey. Uh, he wants to know if there's any upcoming 360 video projects that you could share with the audience. Yes, Jürgen, uh, we have uh, next week is going to be the Hima Himalayas uh, video. And then it is almost ready, the video from Great Barrier Reef from Australia. It's also an aerial video. And then some from Moscow and um, from where else? I just forgot. Actually, that reminds me, Sergey. Can you show the uh, the Himalayas uh, video that you guys did? I, mean, I remember you were saying uh, when I saw you guys present it the first time um, that it was a really it, that it was an amazing challenge because you pushed the limits of the altitude the helicopter could fly. Oh yeah, but there is not a video yet. It's only the, the panoramas. But I could really show. Oh. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Hmm. Oh, sorry, I will show you then on, on, the, on the Google. Um, mm -hmm. It was a very interesting story for us. Uh, we um, Once our friend um, uh, his name is um, <coughs> Dean Kremhmedovich from uh, Hawaii, Hawaiian Islands, uh, from United States. Uh, he he done the shooting for us, uh, the aerial panoramas uh, over the uh, Hawaiian Islands, and he had uh, a pilot, his friend, who was uh, uh, who was taking him. In the air with the with his equipment, and once we visit the um, Everest Mount, and uh, wanted to to rent a helicopter, and explain to the pilot what we want to do. So okay, guys, I know what you are talking about because I have a friend in Hawaii that I'm come from, came from. Uh, we were flying with him uh, in uh, Hawaii. Say, but sorry, <laughs> you're here in the Everest and it's Nepal. It's mountains, and you were flying there in the islands. You, you're gonna fly here? Say, yes, I'm your pilot now here. I know everything about the piloting with everything because he's really professional uh, of, um, pilot. And they took everything out the helicopter and they left only the photographer, it was uh, Ivan Roslikov from our team, and uh, the pilot, and the um, oxygen balloon for, for the pilot, and not for the <laughs> for the photographer. Oh so, no! <laughs> yeah. Here is the one of the highest uh, panorama we took. Here is the altitude around 700 meters. I would say even a little bit uh, over it. 
it's almost the limit for the helicopters um, because of the absence of, uh, of air at the altitudes and uh, very difficult for helicopters for the rotors to keep the, uh, the power and to, to catch, let's say, the, the air. The hold itself uh, and such <coughs> other. Um, so, yep, it was the story. And after 15 minutes uh, or 25 minutes, I would say, uh, of flight, our photographer was completely <laughs> out of oxygen. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, man. almost losing a uh, <laughs> uh, sense of. Uh, <laughs> Of everything, and they say, "Okay, let's land, let's land." And they went to 4,000 meters, and after a couple of hours, they repeat the flight. But everything here was covered by clouds already. That's uh, incredible. <coughs> That's really incredible. So here you may see uh, the balance with the with the fuel for the helicopters and the preparation uh, of the equipment of everything. Oh. Phenomenal work, guy, Sergey. Um, do you ever do you have people in Russia or outside of Russia wanting to work with you on a regular basis? Actually, we have uh, one of our members. It's uh, Mike uh, Mike Raifman. He's from Chicago. He's doing uh, some. He's a very good friend of us and very good photographer. And he is doing some time, from time to time, the shooting for us. And we have a group of photographers here in Moscow. Uh, we have even a kind of photographer, photographical club um, or society. And uh, sometimes we ask them to shoot uh, for us some places. For example, the trip to the North Pole is uh, extremely expensive. And uh, we asked uh, our friend uh, to help us with this because uh, he was uh, among the team. And we explained him and teach them how to, to shoot the panoramas from air. We gave him all our equipment. And uh, so he, he did these panoramas uh, for us from the, from the ship and from the North Pole. But I would say that it was a really difficult task for the team and for the ship to find the ice. Because nowadays it's a really problem uh, with, the, with the North Pole, uh, the, the ice is melting. And um, at the geographical or physical North Pole, there were no ice at all. Oh, Completely wow. That's amazing. Clear. Clear ocean. It's not exactly this place, but for the for the people who took the tickets to, 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 to have a trip to the North Pole, like a usual tourist, this is not the original North Pole. <laughs> yeah, because you see the, the water is melting. It's a really a problem for an overheating on over the globe. So and they really couldn't find the place uh, where to have a lunch and a barbecue and they put a sign that is uh, North Pole. Well, it seems uh, like with an aerial photograph, you could just fly over the phys actual physical location. I know they were so stressed to, to find the, the place for the barbecue because it is on the program, and they didn't allow to fly <laughs> over the original uh, geographical um, North Pole. So they were swimming all around to find, uh, trying to find the ice. Do you guys have the South the South Pole uh, in your future future plans? <laughs> we did almost very close. It was South Georgia, but not exactly the South Pole, but <laughs> very close. Yeah. Well, amazing stuff. Really amazing. I'm sure. Um, you know, I'm sure our audience is very impressed as they always are by all of the work that your team does. Um, and you know, again, I want to say thank you so much for being willing to to join us so late at night in uh, in Moscow to to show us this amazing content. Um, and uh, you know, if you, can you if you can stay on, uh, if you're willing to stay on, Sergey, while Mar Martin do Morton does his um, presentation, and then maybe uh, by then we'll have more questions um, from the from the live audience. Yeah, sure. Um, 
Yeah. I will just try to fix the the camera and maybe I will. Yep. So we're gonna we're gonna switch it over to uh, to Morton right now. Um, this is Morton Bow, uh, and he is uh, coming live from uh, Perth, uh, which is Western Australia. Um, and uh, Morton, are you there? I am, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, excellent. So if you want to go ahead and introduce, introduce uh, your, your company and, and what you guys do. Great. And kind yeah. of show us some of your work, and that would be fantastic. All right. Uh, firstly, thank you, Sergey. That was just amazing. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to be quite as impressive with uh, panos from all over the world, but... Uh, but uh, I think maybe for anyone who's who's learning how to how to do these, I, I hope I can give some information that will help uh, you you guys try and, and do the same thing that Sergey and uh, and his team and also myself have done. Uh, we we started similarly to to what um, Airpano did. I, I I was fortunate enough to run into a um, a pilot of a helicopter shooting. Um, I was actually shooting real estate. And uh, just through conversation, when we found out what I was doing, he said, oh, why don't, why don't we try and do one up in the air? Uh, he has his own helicopter. He works for a, um, a news team over here in, in Western Australia, in Perth. And, yeah, he was really proactive in, in learning uh, what we needed to do to, to make a pano. And uh, the same as was mentioned before, we had to... Do a little bit of trial and error. <clears throat> um, the, this was maybe four four years ago now for me um, that I shot my first one, uh, and uh, it was really quite tricky. I was pretty nervous because it's quite an expensive uh, uh, little task to to have a helicopter flying around for an hour or so, and um, I had all sorts of equipment that probably wasn't fully tested. Uh, Actually, I've got something back here. I'll just grab it. <laughs> so this this was my uh, my plan was to have this uh, this monopod with um, uh, at the time I was shooting probably a D uh, D three hundred I think. And uh, using the uh, so Nikon Nikon camera, <coughs> and I had to use the uh, the the trusty uh, Nikon 10.5 fisheye, which is still one of the best and most commonly used um, lenses for panos. Very excellent lens. And I had a uh, harness on. Uh, I was hanging out uh, over the um, over the skids. And basically, I I point uh, I point the camera out to the horizon. Um, I actually I I use it in um, in landscape mode. Uh, sorry, in portrait mode, should I say, uh, to try and capture as much of the up and down as as possible. And yeah, I t I told uh, Stefan, who's the pilot, that uh, I I wanted him to do a circle and. Uh, He's he similarly to uh, Sergey's story. He sort of said, "Oh, I'm I'm not sure what's going to happen when we do this because it's uh, it's quite dangerous. Uh, the the, um, the rear propeller of the helicopter is very important for stability, and as you as you circle around, uh, you go through the helicopter goes through its own um, its own um, wake, and essentially the first few times, and I, I'm I'm not understanding what's going to happen so I'm hanging out of this helicopter with with a harness harness on um, I use a, a a boogie board strap which is what I use when I go surfing on my wrist so I didn't drop the camera <laughs> that's awesome <coughs> and um, we uh, yeah so we did some circles um, the, the first time we hit the wake of the helicopter it, it was quite violent. It really shook around uh, quite a lot. Um, this is a fairly small, um, it's a, a petrol-powered helicopter. And, um, yeah, so it, it was a bit of a shock. And 
of course, we're communicating on the radio, and, and he said, oh, that wasn't so good, was it? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but, <laughs> but are we, is it okay to try again? And, uh, yeah, we had, a, we had a really uh, interesting experience for the first time trying, you know, trying these circles. And I guess when I think back of it, I thought, well, you know, were, were we really in danger? Was this, was this a silly uh, sort of thing to try? But um, yeah, look, he was he was a really good pilot, uh, or is a really good pilot. He's he's still with us, um, and I can probably show you that. I think this is the first um, the first panorama. I'll I'll try the screen share uh, here. I'm hoping. Whoa, I got kind of a crazy thing happening there. Sure. Yeah. So what you do is when you screen share, you can actually instead of selecting your desktop to share it. Uh, just select yep. the, open up a separate window, you know, and you can select that particular window that you want to share. Sure. Okay. So let it try. Uh, that's that's the one I want to share. Let me try. Can you you guys can't see anything yet? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, here we go. Oh. Yeah, I can see it now. Okay. So it's actually this this one uh, right here, actually. Yeah. So this this was our first uh, panorama out of a, a helicopter with um, with Stefan, the uh, awesome pilot. Uh, it was actually it was a job. So so my motivation is probably a little different to Air Panos. Um, I've been using these um, for education virtual tours. A lot of schools over here in in Australia or Western Australia are really keen to show off their uh, the private schools want to show off their facilities. So this is a <coughs> a private school where I could show off uh, the grounds, the fact that they're on a river here. Um, you can see the playing fields below. Uh, you guys can see that, okay, Gavin? Yeah, it looks beautiful. Um, if, you, if you just if you scroll a little bit slower, it, it uh, the yep. resolution loads nicer. And and yeah, so um, the other exciting part was um, I, I'll just zip around a little bit to find this particular spot, but um, uh, oh, you can probably see up in this or in the middle of the screen now. Uh, we were actually in the flight path of. Uh, <laughs> Of the Perth Airport, so we the other excitement was that we only had limited time, and every now and then we had to actually shoot away. We had to uh, <laughs> go and hide from the uh, incoming jets and things. Oh so, my god! Uh, yeah, so that was my very first um, aerial panorama, and uh, very exciting. Um, I, I mean, it's such a cool thing to do, and I think I think if uh, if any of the the listeners here uh, or watchers uh, are um, thinking of it, then definitely plan well and um, you know have a go because it's it, even if even if it messes up, it's probably an, an expensive mistake, but um, but really cool, really cool to try. Um, I mean, so these are quite quite I won't say boring, but they're not not overly exciting. Um, I'll show you how we utilize them for um, for the schools. Um, you guys can still see. Yeah, it's looking good. Okay, so this one here, I'll just try and refresh. Uh, so we we utilize uh, we use utilize, uh, utilize a, a bit of software by. Um, by Trusty called uh, Flashificator, and um, it, it allows you to do a, a, a lot of stuff to customize uh, these tours, and that includes these instructions and so forth. But um, yeah, this this was my first um, school which I later added this aerial pano to, and of course um, uh, they wanted to show off uh, the fact that they're nice and close to the city. Um, You've got some really nice campuses there in Australia. I got to give you that. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, education is. Uh, I mean, that uh, looks much nicer than most of the universities here in the United States. I can say that. 
Yeah, right. Well, not all of this. This uh, this ground with the big uh, high um, lighting towers on it is actually our um, our cricket game, uh, cricket ground called the WACA, the West Australian Cricket Association. Um, and there's also a, 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 a trotting uh, up in the top right hand corner but the school is where the pool is and the big oval and so forth and um, yeah you can see a couple of boats in the river there coming into the rowing shed which was pretty cool as well um, and then of course um, probably my favorite pano uh, that we've done <coughs> is uh, I shot a pano in this in this swimming pool here um, early on and again it's a bit of trial and error. I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but um, but uh, this was one that that did win a um, an award, um, uh, the same as uh, uh, Sergey's mentioned uh, the Epson Awards, and uh, yeah, so it was really fun to to uh, be able to shoot this panorama underwater to show off their pool and uh, obviously the sporting uh, facility. We're... Yeah, we're not we're not seeing anything. Uh, oh, okay. I, I see your. Um, there we go. There it is. Okay, I think I went to full screen, which we probably can't do. So, uh, th this I image. Did you guys shoot as soon as they landed? You shot. Did you pre did you pre shoot the pool? So you shot the other part of the pool first, and then you probably shot the areas where they dived in, and then. Correct. And, yeah. And then render them in. Yeah. So um, the thing about uh, underwater, which adds another difficulty, is that um, because of diffraction, straight lines don't stay straight. So to 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 make it finish and look fairly good takes. I think I spent literally two weeks editing uh, editing this this panorama uh, to make it calf decent. Um, what I did then was I got these guys to stand up on the blocks, and I got sort of the guys on the on the very end in 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 pairs of twos and threes. They jumped in the water first, and then the guy uh, the guy nearest me jumped in on his own. Uh, then the guy opposite on this side here, he he jumped in on his own, and then there's a couple of guys on in the far part of the shot who I got to to jump in again separately. So I sort of had. Um, yeah, just like ten different shots, just of the uh, of the dive, or in fact of each diver, because I needed them then to be balanced um, in the water, so it looked like they all jumped in at the same time. Um, yeah, but it was I was super pleased. Of course, with underwater, if if you're quite shallow, you you can also maintain the the color and clarity, which which disappears when it gets a, a bit deeper. Yeah, that's that's a phenomenal shot. Um, I remember seeing that on the panel awards. So, it's, I'm glad that you, it's kind of interesting that we have two panel award people on this show today. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's funny too. I mean, I know that the the theme of this episode is aerial panoramic photography. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't show other stuff when it relates. And uh, you know, uh, I, there's a shot that Sergey's team did of um of, of an ice cave. Um, yeah. with some divers that that just blew me away when I saw it. But um, it's it's just you know it's really fun to show the diverse locations that you can actually capture. Yeah. Um, you know. <clears throat> and I think I think that's um and look I have to say congratulations to you Gavin for having uh, this sort of a show where we can we can show off uh, our work and also you know we're really promoting um, the panoramic. Uh, world and 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 just what it can do. Um, I still recall seeing my first pano I think I ever saw was um, probably ten years ago, and it was it was a giraffe in a zoo, and it was um, it was in quick time, so there was there wasn't anything else. It was just the image. But I, as soon as I saw it, I thought, Wow, hang on, this is this is such a unique way to to showcase anything um, where you become. The, the person standing in the scene having a look around and um, yeah from that moment on I wanted to learn how, how to do that and uh, yeah I sort of built a, this business TrueView virtual tours around it so that I could uh, I could do just that. It's um, a, you know it's, it, you're absolutely right Morton uh, I find it highly addictive profession because you know 
it's amazing to be able to go capture places that you wouldn't <clears throat> physically be able to go to yourself. I mean, well, we can. We're the photographers, but other people that are that are viewing the images, or even with a quadcopter or an octocopter, you know, if there's a volcano erupting or if there's some valley, uh, there's a lot of valleys in in Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands that yeah. are made of these sort of like craggly mud, and you can't even even a mountain climber can't climb down these these cliff faces without the cliff just falling apart. So the idea to be able to to send a an octocopter down there and capture places, or or you know, in freezing cold water temperatures, or in elevations where there's no oxygen, there's no air. You know, it's it's just there's something very addictive about being able to like get cameras into those locations and capture something and then bring it back and share it with everyone. Um, yeah, you know. Couple of words. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, that, that was the first uh, my impression that I saw. Uh, but what I've got from seeing the, the panorama from the land was almost the same as Martin has. Uh, but when the Oleg, uh, the founder of Airpano project, he told me, okay, let's try this uh, publish on the internet and show to the people because this is the unique uh, way how to bring the people in the place uh, the panorama was shot. Nothing, nothing can do the same. No, no. Um, Photography, no, the video, nothing, because you see uh, the the place uh, with the eyes of the operator, but not your own. And here yeah. you just got the the full freedom of uh, looking around you. Uh, but still, even it, though I didn't believe that uh, it is the interesting things to do, but. After the first aerial panorama shot by Arpano, where there is no helicopter in, in inside the the panorama, uh, then I understand. Okay, yeah, this is the the greatest way to bring the people to the places they never seen and <clears throat> maybe even will not see. Yeah. Even me, and even that places for me was uh, so fantastic and the the way how it looks like because I was sitting in the helicopter I know there is helicopter I feel it but <clears throat> as soon as you get into the place shot from the air without anything it's unbelievable it's yeah. completely blowing away uh, any I think uh, the mind but there is a problem now with the Aeropano members. We are all photographers and we all landscape photographers. We used to travel around the world and shooting interesting places. And now we have no places uh, which is not <laughs> done by us. And yeah. even, uh, let's say, other members of Aeropano, they now went to um, China and shot uh, the Beijing and uh, the Great Wall. And now I understand that. <clears throat> What is the reason for me now to go there? Because I saw so many panoramas from <laughs> <laughs> Beijing and <laughs> yeah. the Great Wall. So this is a kind of a problem for, for travelers, for photographers, because <laughs> it stops yeah. sometimes. Well, you know, Sergey, what I find is that every five or ten years, uh, when new equipment comes out, and you know we've got these higher resolution cameras. I feel like every time there's a uh, higher resolution equipment that maybe it's it's time to go back and reshoot a place so that we can get, you know, sort of more detail from that location. Um, I'm really passionate. I'm, my own, you know, personal take on panoramic photography is I, I'm, I'm madly in love with gigapixel photography. <laughs> but at the same time, it has a huge, there's all sorts of problems, right? Like it's really hard to do an aerial gigapixel photograph. Um, and I hope we get I hope we get there someday. Um, and but what I love about that is, um, for instance, you guys went and shot um, the Air Panel team. I noticed you guys went and did um, Anchor Wat in Cambodia. Yes. And um, and that's those are those those historical um, sites around the world. I think it's really important. Some of those, especially Anchor Wat, um, which is actually deteriorating at a really fast rate. All the rocks are you know falling apart. Uh, you know, for um, historical documentation, it's so important to me to go to those places and just document them as much as possible. Um, and they change over time, right? They, you know, every tourist can decimate a place. Um, you know, there's, um, I just heard a radio report in, um, about, and actually in Russia, in Siberia, that's the, the deepest lake in the world. 
and they're really worried that tourists are coming and kind of destroying it. Um, so I, I think we have a lot of um, we have a, an amazing responsibility on our shoulders to go to these places and actually capture them in great detail and save, kind of preserve them um, for future generations. Yeah, at least bring attention to other people and um, <clears throat> the publicity to some problems. Because we were shooting also the Lake Baikal, it calls the deepest lake. And it is not even a, the problem of the tourists because uh, the sizes of lakes is so great. There is, um, and the, the level of tourists uh, which could, could and we wish to go to the lake is quite low. It's not like Egyptian pyramids or uh, Chinese Great Wall. But there is um, uh, the plant, uh, the factory on the side of the lake which uh, drops uh, the, the water, the, um, how to say, the, the pollutions, it, it pollutes the um, toxic, uh, toxic liquids into the lake and this is the problem and we tried also to rise it uh, with our panoramas and we showed this to the government once and uh, we did the shootings for the Russian news agency and they did the, the news uh, blog um, and they try to raise this problem as well. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. Yeah, I think it's the deepest, it's the largest freshwater, right. Uh, right, in the world, largest sort of, you know, it's actually I think it's it's all the Great Lakes in the United States equal equal that. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and it, still, it's the one of the clearest uh, water in in the world. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, I should, I should turn it back to Morton here and let him uh, continue yeah, yeah, with his presentation. Sorry. 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 <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, I, uh, I just okay. I was going to ask you, you probably can't see um, if I open this in Devil VR. Is that right? Uh, uh, I don't see the... just see your window. Yeah, with so... Uh, let me just see if I can make anything happen here. Does do you do you see anything um, uh, now in terms of a panorama? I I saw you drop uh, with the mouse to the yep. VR player, but yep. nothing happens. Sure, um, it probably need it needs a browser, I suppose. So um, let me just uh, open it in a browser instead. Um, <clears throat> Technology. Uh, I don't see anything, Martin, now on your window. Yeah, thanks, Sergey. I'll, um, I just seem to. Papa, still nothing. No. Okay. Well, I'll I'll just keep talking. Um, you can uh, probably uh, if you can op if if you can open it Photoshop. I think you can share Photoshop with uh, with Google. Oh, that's cool. Look, I, I it was trying to get an interactive. Um, I can't see myself at all at the moment. So, uh, but but I guess um, again, I my um. Uh, my movement then from from the helicopters is same as uh, Sergey and the team. We uh, and only recently we've made a uh, partnership with a group called um, Sensorum, and uh, the I think the way of the future is going to be uh, these UAVs or the unmanned aerial vehicles because all those problems of shooting in helicopters, uh, which which we sort of overcame. Are now um, made a lot simpler by by using these uh, octocopters, uh, hexacopters, or uh, even quadcopters. And uh, I've got uh, again. You probably, I don't think I can. Anyone see or can you see me at the moment or nothing? Uh, no. I, I, I was able to see your um, kind of a folder with uh, a couple of JPEG uh, panoramas, and now I just yeah. see your your uh, your kind okay. of logo. It might just be your your um, 
your um, your your internet connection, your broadband yeah. might be uh, getting clogged. Although it's although it's probably in the middle of the night there, so I can't imagine everyone's in Western uh, Australia is up using the internet. Yeah, and and I, I know I've got my my connection's like a hundred megabits or something crazy. So yeah, um, why don't you uh, why don't you try signing off and signing back on again? Yeah, I can. Um, I might try. Yeah, that that because I think Sergey had to do that. Um, sure. Before and it worked pretty well. Uh, so would I just uh, close myself here? Yeah. Um, are you able to sign me off, or or do I need to? Can I do that myself? I think you have to do that on your end. Yeah. Let me see. I have hang off the 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 call oh. and then. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I'll I'll give that a try. Yeah. So Sergey, while we're waiting for Morton to come back, um, do you have any advice for for people that want to get into aerial photo uh, panoramic photography? Yeah, if they want to try, <clears throat> maybe the mo the cheapest variant to find the the real helicopter in the place and um, ask about the price because, for example, in the United States it's uh, quite cheap yeah, comparing to other places. Uh, the Robinson 44, it's the small helicopter which could handle um, or which fits uh, three, uh, three photographers, two on one side and one to another side. It costs around 600 or 800 dollars uh, per hour. So if you want to start uh, with uh, at least something, you could take this helicopter to rent it, maybe even not an hour, but half an hour it is also allowed it, and uh, take another photographer and, or a friend of you and share the costs. So it's going to be even in the case of $800 per hour, take uh, half an hour, so with 400 and share the costs uh, even between two people, it's 200 now it's quite enough uh, for testing the equipment and starting at least from th something. Hey, um, uh, Gerald Donovan has a user question. Um, he wants to know. Um, he'd be interested to hear what your what you think the biggest challenge is when it comes to shooting panoramas from helicopters and and how to how to overcome that. Do you think it's just the cost? Do you think really that's the hardest thing? Is just coming up with funds to to rent a helicopter for enough time to to be in the air to get the shots you need and. No, no. What do you th so back to oh you're back thank you, Martin you, we got the connection working again that's great yeah cool I'm sure Sergey would agree that um, I I would say if, if you're going to attempt one you you'd want a lot of experience you'd want to have done a lot because um, to get it all right up in the air is is pretty tricky um, the the challenge is to keep um, I probably the pilot is as important as the photographer because. Uh, what happens when a when a helicopter turns in the air, especially the smaller ones, which you'd probably be renting um, because of cost, um, they t they tend to drop quite fast. So, um, and the hotter it is, they the faster they drop. So, one of one of my sh shoots, we actually um, we dropped so fast that the the pilot had to go into a dive to to get enough speed up again to um, to get elevation. So, oh my god. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's and and I don't think it's um, when it I think it was about forty degrees Celsius that day, so the the air is very light and it, it it's difficult for the the chopper to maintain um, its its elevation. But um, I, I think it's it's certainly doable once you've done it. But I I think you'd have to um, really think through a how you're gonna how are you gonna release your shutter? Um, I use a um, a wireless release even though I'm I'm fairly close to my camera. I don't want to. I don't want to be trying to push the trigger whilst we're turning. Um, you could have a, a, a wired or a cabled shutter, um, but also make sure you know everything about your exposure um, and the simple things like having uh, your batteries charged and everything really ready to go. Um, there's not a lot of time up in the air to be able to change equipment, so you have to have the right lens on if you. Bringing any other equipment, you have to make sure it's tethered. So there's a lot of thought that needs to go in and planning before you actually, I think, take that step. Uh, what, what do you think, Sergey? Is that did you find it? It's a pretty high level of, of panoramic photography. 
yeah, <clears throat> you should all the, all the time be prepared and know your equipment very well, extremely well. I haven't mentioned this just because, uh, I don't know, we just, I used to make a photographs and come to some places and I know my equipment very well. But the, the problem you told the first time, yes, you should, uh, we refused from, uh, from, by the way, wireless um, uh, remotes because uh, in some places like in New York it's stopped working at all because of uh, a lot of um, um, let's say other antennas and uh, the frequencies are uh, occupied and the my remote control for the camera stopped working after one meter lens uh, from, from, from camera so we used the wired uh, one for example, it's one of the problem. And as you told, for for hovering to for the helicopter, <clears throat> especially for a small one, it is very important to have a lightweight inside uh, and the overall helicopter. So I now, after several years of uh, working with the helicopters with the pilots, I know that it shouldn't be f it shouldn't have a full tank of uh, gasoline. It should be at least half because uh, the heavy helicopter couldn't uh, keep the altitude in uh, kind of uh, in case of uh, absence of wind if there is a wind uh, it is much easier for 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 a pilot to hover the helicopter and make a circle and then there are a lot of uh, some small tricks that uh, you could understand only after some flights and some experience yeah um, like, like, like with a full tank, for example, or uh, with the losing of altitude. And in Iceland, uh, we had very, very experienced uh, he um, heli pilot, and he, after after a shooting, a couple of hours of flying, uh, he just told us, "Okay, guys, do you want to make an out rotation landing?" What is me? It means that uh, he switched off the engine of the helicopter and starts uh, just falling down but uh, usually the, the, the chopper, the, uh, have it, the rotor works like a wind, uh, wing um, in the aircraft so it goes not uh, directly uh, down to the land like a stone but uh, with the 45 degrees landing. So wow, it's, it's <laughs> nice that must have been pretty exciting. Yeah, and all the pilots, they should know how to do this because yeah. it's kind of their um, studying uh, just in case of um, uh, the engine stopped working. So he offered us, okay, let's guys, let's do the... <laughs> after you know, it's honestly one of the reasons I prefer being in a helicopter than an airplane. <laughs> yeah. Um, I noticed you guys have a very large Iceland Grand Tour on your website now. Yeah. Um, so it seems almost like you guys were able to get more content from the pilots that you had in uh, in Iceland. They might must have been really, you know, you probably had a good combination of good weather and a good pilot to get all that great content. Content. We were very lucky with the weather because we did most of the panoramas during uh, three days of flights. So we took the helicopter and we took the fuel tank, uh, the car, uh, which was following us. And we were flying from place to place because it usually takes uh, two or three hours between the places, and um, sometimes one or two hours for for flights for photography. And then the car with the fuel was following us uh, by the roads, and we were flying from hotel to hotel, from one place to another, during three days uh, with the helicopter. Wow, Did, were there, were the were the prices better for a helicopter pilot in Iceland than other places? I uh, know it was really expensive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Extremely expensive. But uh, you know, uh, as a photographer, so I would as a photographer, I, I could say that the Iceland is the most uh, unbelievable place. Uh, yeah. You and, definitely you definitely get the most bang for your buck, right? For every yeah. mile, I feel like every mile there's something beautiful to to shoot and there. That's why we decided to make uh, a lot of panoramas there. It was. Uh, I don't know, one of our uh, most expensive tour, I would say, <laughs> virtual tour. Hey, um, Sergey, we have another um, 
we have another user question. Um, uh, it's from Trusty. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, I think he's originally from Iceland, actually. Um, he wants to know how much time is there needed for getting quad or hexa-octocopters up and shooting a scene from, from 50 plus meters height, and what would be the minimum flight time required? Uh, our flights usually last about uh, 10 minutes, not more. Uh, but I would say that the five minutes is enough. Uh, you just need to go up at 50 meters. It's uh, depending on the engines and the rotors you have, maybe 30 seconds and uh, another minute of hovering for the uh, gimbal to work and then uh, land it back. So it, it's very easy and very fast. Do you guys have? Um, do you guys download when you're in a location? Do you guys download the data um, while you're still at the location and review it quickly in order to make sure that you, let's say, you, you it was the, the octocopter was just up there for five, ten minutes, just to oh, make sure work. the content you just captured is. No, oh, we work as a team. So there is a two person uh, usually who works uh, in a team. We have a monitor. Uh, me as a photographer, for example, I have a monitor in, in front of my eyes and I see everything which my camera is uh, looking at. So I could control and tell to, to the pilot uh, where to fly and uh, what the best view to choose. We are not blind in the, in, in the air. We see uh, all the time we control the picture. I mean, uh, in air panel. <coughs> gotcha. So Great. I have another question here. It's about what is the best camera to buy. At the moment, um, I would say that we used to use uh, Canon Mark uh, 5D Mark II, but now we switch to Nikon D800. It's a bit heavier, but the quality and the dynamic range that it gives uh, it's fantastic, phenomenal. I, I did targeting um, <coughs> with the five uh, shots in Nikon, but I got all the exposure from one. Even overexposed and underexposed uh, places, they could be get it back in Photoshop or Lightroom. It's uh, really, really a fantastic camera. And Sergey, as far as have you guys looked in? Um, are you guys excited about the um, the A7R, the Sony, the Sony A7R, since it has the same sensor as the D800? Yeah, we it's work with much the Sony lighter. Russia. Yeah, and the Sony Russia promised us uh, several cameras to test, but uh, it's not that uh, you know fast in Russia. They just got the, the cameras to the official Sony suppliers uh, got the cameras only this week. So next week we'll get our um, test uh, testing units um, from Sony. Yeah, I think those are going to be exciting because they're just so lightweight. Um, the only issue will be how quickly the the data transfers to the card, buffers to the card. Right, right. That'll, that'll be interesting to see. Um, they they promised that the, the, that the processor is very fast. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the card reader, but it should it should handle this. Yeah. Well, let's get back uh, to Morton. I want to I want to continue to show his work here. Uh, while we, while we, it's probably Thanks, very late yeah. in the morning. Yeah, what are we? It's uh, it's four o five a.m. So if I'm, if I oh start, my god, <laughs> okay. If I start lagging, actually, I, I had um, a, quite a few of the panos prepared, um, Gavin, to show in in a view, in another viewer, but it it actually can't um, work on here. So I, I have to use a um, a website. But I'll I'll just show you. A, uh, hopefully, I get a, a screenshot of this. It seems uh, okay. I think I have to have it up first, and then uh, I, I guess I can use the um, the Pano Awards. Uh, that's the wrong one. Ah, it keeps changing location. It's all right. I'll get better at this. Tell me if you can see anything else. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yeah. It's you know what you're doing is um, what happens is you keep on sharing your desktop, and yeah. then what that does is that creates that infinity, yeah, yeah, um, sure. You know, mirror effect. Um, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you uh, get the get the, the get it open on another screen, and then when you go to Google Plus Hangouts screen share, 
you select that other other browser, that other window, specifically that other window, not just your desktop. Yeah, it should okay. be general options. Um, which I... What, what you want to do first is you want to turn off screen share and then turn it back on. Um, and that'll kind of refresh it. Okay. So try to go back to your camera first, uh, your camera with you. Yeah. Let's try that. Uh, when I press you, I actually see uh, I see you instead of me. So. <laughs> oh yeah, try to get and uh, yeah, try to get to. Um, just pressing yourself here. Yeah. Well, I was considering showing the, the audience my lame attempt at aerial panoramas, but <laughs> just just because, um, you know, what's funny is, you know, basically when we show Sergey and, and the work that Air Pano does and the work that Morton does, that's basically the the bar they've set. You know, they've this is as good as it gets right now for both the combination of artistic uh, sensibilities and the professional uh, photographers that are you know, that are involved, and also the technical limitations. You know, they've pushed that up as far as it goes based on what you have now. So then you take me, and I'm way down here, <laughs> and I have a, um, I use a, a DJI Phantom, um, which is a very low end. It's probably the entry level um, quadcopter that you can get. And, um, and I just, you know, basically attached a metal wire um, to, the, to the quadcopter, and I have a you know the the uh, theta uh, the, Ryko, uh. the Ryko theta, and so what I do is I hang it upside down, and then I fly the quadcopter, the DJI, and this is so light that I can actually the DJI quadcopter. I get I can get in the air for 15 minutes, and what's actually really nice is that this transmits its own Wi-Fi network. So I have the um, my iPhone 5 kind of glued to the to the uh, quadcopter controller, and so as I take pictures with it, this retransmits the photograph back to the to my iPhone. So what's really nice about that is I can keep the quadcopter up in the air for 15 minutes and just be streaming uh, the images, the the panoramas back. And the iPhone controls the exposure of this device, so I can say, oh, it's you know the exposure is too low, and let's let's change that. Um, and I'm hoping that if 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 uh, if Rico is listening, um, we've we've had panoramic photographers on this forum. They've actually uh, cracked this thing open and looked at the the, the files that this thing is generating, and uh, it looks like there is HDR capabilities inside this device. So Rico, I hope if you're listening that you um, that you kind of update the firmware soon so that we can play around with those other features that this device has. But um, what I can do is, um, you know, I can show the audience. Um, you know, my low-level uh, <laughs> uh, aerial, attempted aerial panoramas, um, just to kind of show people the, the lowest common denominator. We showed air pano, which is the highest common denominator. <laughs> and uh, we can show... Oh, okay. It's a nice start for a gigapixel panorama. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here, uh, let me bring it up, um, and then see if uh, Morton. We got you back. Yeah, we got you back. Yeah, I'm kind of back. I'm just having trouble getting anything else up, but that's okay. Sure, sure. So let's just show you my my lame attempt at an aerial. Um, I have some questions. Uh, getting to to my uh, section with the questions and answers, uh, but I couldn't answer them by text, only by voice. So oh, maybe sure, I, sure. Yeah, I will answer them. Sure, oh. sure. Yeah, so here's my, uh, this is, I'm just going to show, I'm, I'm not going to torture our audience because, um, you know, they've been pleased by everything so far. So, But uh, this is just a really fun thing I wanted to show because when you think about aerial panoramas, you also think about how, how you know, you get into above trees and above a forest, but what about the idea of flying it through a forest? And uh, you can imagine the precision that's needed. So what I really liked about the DJI Phantom was that it's such a small device. It's only about a foot and a half um, in, you know, in diameter. And uh, so I was able actually to fly it through these trees, which was really fun. 
Um, oh yeah. And um, uh, we were. This is about forty feet in the air, so I'm way down there. You can see my face down there. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So it's very low resolution. There's the uh, DJI Phantom above me. Uh, and uh, so anyway. So That's for for the people watching this show that want to just start out with something really fun, uh, you know, it's it's about I don't know it was four hundred dollars five hundred dollars for the DJI Phantom and another four hundred for the 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 Rico Theta. So it's under a thousand dollars you can start doing low quality images and um, yeah. So I thought that would be worth showing. Anyway, uh, so let me stop screen share. There we go. So Morton, we'll, uh, do you have anything queued up uh, that you yeah, can show? Uh, is that working? Is Are you seeing anything on screen share there? I see myself being rebroadcast in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why. Um, it keeps putting you in my screen. but. Uh, oh, that's weird. Do you want to so, try logging out again and logging yeah, back in? Yeah, I've done it twice, but it, it seems to, um, yeah. Yeah, again the mirror effect. Yeah. So I seem to be whoever else is speaking. Well, you know what? I can I can bring up your links. Do you, can you if you Martin if you want to ping me a link to show? Um, we did that with our last show because we had one of the guests that was oh, broadcasting sure. live off of a sailboat, um, <laughs> yeah, right. sixty miles off of an island in uh, somewhere between oh. New Zealand and Australia. Oh look, and I if you can I. Um, if you do, if you do go to the Epson Panel Awards site, I was just going to show one that I shot from a, um, a an ultralight, just to show a di a, another way that you might shoot an aerial. Okay. Um, so for this year's awards, if you um, if you open the chat window, which is um, I think it's the top left icon on your on your Hangout screen. Yeah. You can you can paste the Epson Panel Award site link that you have. Okay. They're in there, and then I can I can broadcast it on my screen. Again, there is a question uh, from sure. Jan Lika. Uh, oh yeah, can you answer that, Sergey? Oh yeah, uh, Gavin, can you post the link to Theta Pano? I cannot see the link. Sure, I actually have it on my. Um, let me bring it back up again. Um, so uh, the question is it by Jan Lipka. Um, basically, all you have to do is go to I. Um, the interesting thing I should mention about uh, the Ryko Theta is that uh, they send the device itself captures a higher resolution panorama, and then it it uploads via its own wireless network to your iPhone a lower resolution version. Unfortunately, that lower resolution version is the only version that you can uh, upload to the Ryko Theta website. In that situation, a lot of us more professional panoramic uh, photographers, I actually wait to that hook up my Theta to you know my computer at home. I download the higher resolution image. I do some post production work on it, and then I actually um, upload it to 360cities.net. Um, so if you go to 360cities.net and you just type in Theta, you will be able to see all my images. Um, I know it's kind of an issue with um, with the 360cities.net folks is um, they like to keep all their panoramas very high quality on that website. Um, so I think they're a little upset that all of us are <laughs> shooting these lower lower quality panoramas with the Ryko Theta and uploading them there and kind of uh, cluttering up their uh, their high quality. Uh, Panoramas. So um, sorry about that, uh, Jeffrey and and the 360 Cities team. Um, okay, let me bring up this uh, this link here for Mark. Not sure. Martin. I'm not not 100 percent sure it will work because it it opens into a uh, into a, uh, a shadow box, so that might be a problem. It, okay, we'll give it a try. It's, well, it's a learning process. I I actually. I was going to show you. I thought I could see my desktop, so I've got all my panos prepared to drop into. Uh, okay, the, can you guys see that? Uh, no. No. Me not. No. Ah, yeah. Now I see this screen of panel words. I think what happens though is when you click on any of those, they. Um, which well, let me, let's give it a try. Uh, which uh, your is yours is on year two thousand twelve, I think, or is yeah. it? Yeah. 
the one I was going to show is right down the bottom. It's uh, position 47 or something. Okay, let me check it out. Okay, let's give it a try. But I think... Yeah, I don't... Oh, yeah, it yeah. works. Oh, yeah, it works. Can you guys see that? Yep. Uh, now we can, and it's pretty small because it's in a shadow box. But it was just, it was fun because this guy, um, he uh, he does the um, uh, these ultralight planes, and if you look straight down, it was just a go It's a gorgeous place in uh, Western Australia, in X Mount. Wow! Look at that. And, and uh, it, it, I, I couldn't shoot the Nadir because we were in in mid air, and I I would have shot it on the ground later on, but it, it I. It was my first time doing it on the, one of these, but you, I think you could even shoot a pano from a you know one of these ultralights. I just again had a tripod. You have to be extra careful because the props at the back. So if you dropped anything uh, and it sucked into the prop, you would you'd be going down. So oh my so, god, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. But uh, yeah, we could see whales down below us in the water and. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of those, which were just fantastic fun. Are they are they in here or? Yeah, that's. Uh, no, then they're not, and unfortunately, I've only prepared them as um, as panos to to view it by a Devil VR, so I don't actually have them on a website. Um, but yeah. So is that just fun. is that so? Are there, that's you right here, right? Uh, no, that's the pilot, Gavin. Oh, um, he's from here. a. This guy, that's, that's you. Yeah. Nice. But, but truly, uh, really difficult because you know you you're kind of just sitting in the back of this thing and hanging a hanging a uh, monopod out. But I think for someone, anyone who's got access to you know any way to get up in the air, it's it's still possible to do it, and um, that, that's what makes it really fun. And I think really, what what Sergey and all the guys at, at um, Air Pano do, and what I guess we're all starting to do is just say you know. It's not just about a pano is 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 not unique because it's a panorama. We need to make it exciting. You know, there's there's some, a panoramic's 360, so there's something above you, there's something below you. There's, um, you know, it it takes you to that place, uh, and I, I reckon that's uh, that's what sells the the industry, and that's that's what we should keep pushing ourselves for is to to do really unique things underwater, in the air, um, wherever it is. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you inter you you raise a really interesting point. Um, as a panoramic photographer, you, when you think about composition, it's it's you're taking it to a whole another level because you really do want there you want there to be something interesting in all directions. Definitely. So definitely. you have to you have to almost when you're you know when you get to a point where you're ready to shoot, you have to conceptualize what it, what is the person going to see all around me in every direction. Yeah. And I think for, for anyone who's starting, I, I see a lot of panos, um, perhaps it's a beautiful beach scene or it's it's a beautiful place and people think about it like a still photograph. It's it's very different. Um, if if there's nothing above you, then it, it may as well be a, a still photograph. Some, sometimes it's nice because the sky is brilliant above you, but other times you should stand under a tree or, or go right next to a cliff so that people get that sense of being close to things because a fisheye lens, it makes everything so far away as uh, Sergey said before. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah. you, you really, you need to, you need to fill your scene with, with some, something interesting. Um, don't shoot a, a beach scene in the car park with a beach in the distance because it just looks terrible. Yeah. I agreed. Agreed. Um, Morton, is there anything else that you want me to, to, to get on this site or is or maybe another, you want to ping me another uh, link to somewhere else? No, that's all right, Gavin. I, as I said, I unfortunately, um, I'll, I'll have to come back again and, and uh, prepare it online instead so that I, uh, I get Definitely. that part right. <laughs> well, we've been broadcasting for two hours, which is pretty yeah. amazing. Um, we should probably uh, start to say our goodbyes. Uh, I would. I, I want to make sure you have a chance to go to bed, go to sleep. I yes. know you've, been, you've stayed up all night. Um, I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm. Um, I'm creating a lot of uh, sleepless Australians these days with the, my my shows. That's it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just that yeah. for the time we usually set is, um, you know, it works well for Europeans and uh, 
for people in the U.S., but uh, people in Asia, the, our, our hosts, our guests in Asia and Australia seem to always have the, the short end of the stick, so apologies about that. Um, no, that's all right. And I, I loved the show about the ocean stuff last week or a couple of weeks ago, was it? It was just yeah. fantastic. It was super cool. Um, yeah, we're going to have all those guests on again. I mean, the, you know, um, all the work we do is ongoing. I, I know Sergey's team is constantly, I think they upload new content every week. Yep. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's always new content to be shown. I think what what I'd like to say for people that watch the show and um, – you know, I think it's just a lot more exciting uh, to hear from the photographers um, what they were thinking when they were shooting it. And you know, what's really amazing about about our our images is sometimes the images themselves are amazing, but then when you actually hear what what went behind creating those images, it's then it becomes even more amazing because you're like, oh my god, it's incredible that like. You know, you couldn't, no one's ever shot there before or, you know, the weather was so extreme or, like, you know, you almost died shooting it or, you know, what have you. It's it's so much, and that's what this, what, what I love about this show is that we're able to actually add an extra level of detail um, for, yes. for people. And uh, so I hope, I hope everyone enjoys this and I hope uh, we can get, you know, um, all our guests back on to show their, their, their work that they, they do in six months from now. Um, yeah. Definitely. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited because I've, I've, uh, as I said, I've got a lot better access now to uh, the unmanned aerial vehicle, and I think that's that's going to open a lot of. Uh, oh yeah, it looks like you got something right behind you there. Yeah, yeah. It's, Can you show it's, us that? What is that? Is that yeah. the DJI? No, it's a bit bigger than the DJI. It's a uh, now what's it? It's a free fly. Um, it's a, eight, a octocopter with a or what they call an eight multi copter. Um, this is the, this is a partner of ours called uh, Sensorum, and they uh, they're actually pilots. So, as um, uh, Sergey mentioned, uh, the, in Australia, the, the the laws are really changing. So, they ha they are certified to fly um, via our um, our, um, our the, the the aerial certification. Civil Air um, requires that they um, if we do any official work, have to have the correct license and so forth. But yes, this this is a smaller one, which I've uh, I've got uh, in the background today, and we we've got a uh, a heavy lifter which can carry about four kilos. What what sort of weights do you guys carry, Sergey, for your um octocopter or your uh, hexacopter? Uh, three kilos. Three kilos. Okay, so I think. Uh, yeah, we the 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 new one they have is a um, is a four. Uh, four kilo maximum load, um, and of course that just simply uh, makes it easier to um, to put something like this on there. By the way, I didn't show you that. Wow! How, like, how do you like that sucker? <laughs> oh my God. Is that that? Is that that? What, what lens is that? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna make it look like the six millimeter, but it's not. Okay. It's the, uh, it's the eight millimeter um, uh, fisheye. It's the old eight millimeter. That's a real classic. Um, Nikon lens, wow. but um, surprisingly, um, the uh, the the old 10.5 I reckon is still just as it's a sharp. I, I've shaved that to um, to be able to utilize um, on the D800, and you've got 36 megapixels of full frame, pretty much fisheye, um, and I, I still the Sigma. I've also got the Sigma. We we utilize that, which is really sharp, and um, the 16 mil on the on the full frame will be um, that will make it even higher res. So I'm, I'm planning once once we get our um, act together with the uh, unmanned aerial to try and up the resolution. Because if I could shoot 16 mil um, yeah. six around and a couple of shots down, and then uh, do a bit of patchwork on the sky, you can get some super high res stuff with the D800s. So that's pretty exciting. But um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I'll carry that one. That's it, it's a bit of a collector's item, so I don't think I'll put that one up in the air. Actually, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I do. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna probably crash before I. Uh, I start dribbling because my. I can't <laughs> much. Much yeah. sense of myself at the moment. Well, you know, you guys. Uh, you should look into if you want to go lighter. You should definitely look into that Sony A7R. 
Right. Yeah. Out. I just bought this. Um, you got, do you guys know about this company? Metabones. Yeah, they do the. Um, uh, how do you call it? It's their conversion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. This. So this will fit on the new A7R, and I can mount any of my Canon uh, lenses on there. Oh, and, right. they, and they also make it for Nikon and Sigma and every other. I mean, any kind of lens that you want to put on the new that new uh, Sony, you can you can get it through through Metabones. And I should say they are not they are not sponsors of the show yet. <laughs> they should uh, be. <laughs> so, but maybe they would be interested. So, uh, anyway, well, uh, Morton, thank you so much uh, yeah. for for you know staying up very late or very early in West My Australia. Pleasure. I hope to come visit you one day. <laughs> yeah, well, you make make sure you come to Perth. Um, I, I'm sure I'm going to be watching your other programs. I reckon it's fantastic. I apologise that I, I really didn't have it together there with the um, the. I, I've got a lot of sh stuff to show, but it's not going to work this time. I'll, I'll try and do it another time. Uh, you know what? It's uh, totally fine. I mean, honestly, yeah. Google keeps on changing the interface every time I log in. It's completely different. So, yeah. you know, it's a learning curve for all of us. Um, and I think I've got about 200 questions for Sergey, but I reckon I might have to contact him another time, and uh, yeah. I'd love to pick his brains on on some of the stuff that they use, and and uh, yeah, just because there's so few of us that are doing it, that it's it's great to share some notes, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Easily contact me on Facebook or write an email to info at airpana.com because we all all the time is checking up the the emails. So any yeah, questions. Thanks. Uh, and the other viewers of this video, they could also address the, the questions to info at airpanel.com. Uh, we check these emails regularly. Me or those guys from my team, we will definitely answer them. Yeah. And, and Sergey, if you're okay with it, we can also post links on the, um, when we finish this broadcast, we put it on an archive page. Um, so if you, if you guys are okay with that, we can link to, to Airpano. Yeah, it's okay because uh, we also has it as official email address for all the the questions, so it's yeah. okay. Yeah, and Morton, where can people find you? Yeah, so uh, trueview.com.au is the website. Um, I can I can pop that somewhere on your site um, uh, so people can link to it. Uh, we've got uh, most of our work is is project work for. Um, uh, you know, like it might be tourism or education or something like that. So, um, but I'm always, it's always great to contact, uh, get people contacting. Anything that promotes uh, our industry, I think, is really positive. Uh, yourself, Gavin, for doing this, I think, is uh, is really, really uh, useful. Um, I, I've got to thank uh, John Walkington because he put me in contact with you, and uh, <laughs> he's, a, he's a real passionate dude about uh, Pano's. Over here in Oz, uh, he might even be going back to the states, I believe. But uh, yeah, we um, hope to have we hope to have him on uh, for a future episode as well. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, I'll be watching. So thanks a lot for having me on. Thank um, you, Morton. I appreciate it. Uh, my my koala and I are going to go to bed. <laughs> awesome, Sergey. Yeah. Thank you also so much for for joining and and sharing the work that you and your team have been doing. It's just truly phenomenal. And um, and yeah. Do you have any parting words, or uh, where's that, that hat of yours? <laughs> Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Martin, as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank again. you. Okay, well, at, um, on that note, I just want to thank all our viewers for tuning in, and um, I'm really excited and happy that we were able to get the, the question and answers uh, live panel working. This, this is the first episode where we actually had it working. Um, so thank you to our audience for submitting questions, and um, we hope you uh, tune into uh, the next broadcast. Uh, the next broadcast will be with uh, will be actually a live broadcast um, in Los Angeles out of uh, X Res Studio. Um, they're a visual effects house um, that does groundbreaking work for um, National Geographic and for um, a lot of uh, dome theater productions. And um, they've also broken some new barriers in the um, spherical panorama industry. So uh, we'll have uh, Eric um, and uh, Greg Downing and Eric Hansen out of broadcasting out of their studio. So hopefully you can uh, tune into that. That's going to be in two weeks on a Saturday. And we'll make sure that we uh, we get all the links up in, on the forum so you guys can, uh, can actually tune in for that as well. All right. Well, thank you, Morton, and thank you so much, Sergey. And uh, we'll see you guys next uh,
we'll see you guys on the flip side. Thanks, Kevin. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye, Sergey.